Thanks for joining us today. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Lee Ji-yoon in Seoul. Before we get started, let's first get a glimpse of today's highlights. Lotto sales marked an 11-year high last year in Korea, reflecting the hard times that people are going through as uncertainties cloud the sluggish domestic economy. Deflationary risks are keeping alarm bells ringing in countries around the world, with Korea being no exception to this threat. We sit down with an expert to talk about this. They say a second startup boom is blowing here in Korea, but we have yet to see undisputable success stories in recent years. The government has thrown itself into the, its creative economy drive, so what are the conditions that are missing? Our Eunice Kim takes a look. This past October, an autonomous car built by a local startup entered testing without human hands on the wheel. Global companies like Google and Mercedes-Benz are in it too. And keeping up with the fierce competition means a lot of trial and error in road tests. Three months later, the car was found not riding asphalt, but parked indoors. As you can see, there are a lot of attachments to the car. Their modifications considered illegal under the current Automobile Management Act. Without easing such regulations, this test car is forever banned. The first hurdle to realizing much-desired future growth engines are rules that block innovative thinking itself. In a positive system, you're banned from doing anything beyond what's allowed. In a negative system, you can do everything except what's banned. It's not enough to simply ease certain rules. Given this, Korea's so-called second startup boom is not producing diverse, cutting-edge enterprises, as the government's creative economy drive had hoped. We're seeing a lopsided startup boom, for example, in social networking or delivery apps, because other areas are off-limits. This is why simply doing away with regulations is not enough. Nurturing an ecosystem that encourages independent thinking and autonomy from conglomerate comforts are needed, too. Take Finland. Nokia, in its heyday, made up 4 percent of its economy. But when the mobile phone giant went south, instead of doom and gloom, the Nordic nation saw a rise of startups. The secret to success was in education. In 2009, the Finnish government inserted entrepreneurship and startup education in its curriculum. This led to a natural progression of college students selecting that path. In the Korean context, a fair competitive field for startups and family-run conglomerate chebars are needed. Better yet, thoughtful collaboration over competition between the two entities could jumpstart not only the startup boom, but the country's leap into future growth engines. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. Alcohol, cigarettes and lottery tickets. These three items are tagged as the vices of an economic downturn. And sure enough, lotto sales are up, even though consumer sentiment as a whole is in the doldrums. Our Kim min has the story. In case you couldn't tell, this store has been flagged a lucky lotto spot after a ticket bought here handed its owner the jackpot. As a matter of fact, lotto sales last year raked in an 11-year high. Koreans bought nearly $2.7 billion worth, an on-year growth of 6.8 percent. I spent about $12. Goes without saying I'm eyeing the jackpot. Korea's six-digit lotto game launched in 2002 has been the most profitable in hard times. After enjoying shotgun demand at the start, ticket sales steadily dropped, that is, until the global economic crisis. Sales have been on a steady climb since 2008 as more Koreans try their luck. And this year has been no exception. With uncertainty clouding the global economy and volatility straining financial markets, sentiment is low, as low as it was during Korea's debilitating MERS scare last year. The exception has been the lottery. January has already seen an on-year increase of 7.7 percent, selling on average $56 million worth over last month's four rounds. 
The Finance Ministry's Lottery Committee, which attributes the rise to more sales outlets, plans to expand the number of sellers by 2,000 through next year. The economy is down and things are rough, so I buy them. I wish they'd add another draw in the week, on Wednesdays. Last year, the average sum spent on one round of lotto was 8,231, less than seven bucks. But the number of luck seekers spending hundreds of dollars a week on tickets also reached more than 40,000. Kim Minji, Business Daily. Amid the slowing global economy, the shadow of deflation hangs heavily over many countries around the world, echoing concerns that things might go from bad to worse. Take a look. Falling consumer prices, known as deflation, is considered just as large a threat as inflation. Once it settles in, companies and consumers close their wallets, and the real value of debt begins to climb, sending the economy down a deflationary spiral and into recession. Following predictions of a prolonged trend of cheap oil and continual signs of a slowing Chinese economy, concerns over deflation are on the rise. According to a report from Bloomberg, a total of 19 countries out of 97 are expected to inch closer toward minus inflation this year, the largest in number since the 2008 financial crisis when the global economy was turned upside down. Japan has joined several European countries in adopting negative interest rates, pulling out even stronger measures of monetary stimulus to counter downward pressure. Economists are worried that monetary easing aimed at boosting investment and consumption hasn't been effective enough, as countries are now saddled with chronic record low interest rates. So with the global economy suffering from feeble growth and low inflation, what can countries do to escape the trap of deflation? And to tell us more about this, Professor Yang jun suk from the Catholic University of Korea joins us in the studio today. So good to see you, Professor. Happy to be here. All right, so why should we worry so much about deflation? Okay, well, uh, falling prices, deflation, uh, it could be due from increased productivity or uh, decreased demand. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's from increasing productivity, that's good because, well, it means everybody's more productive. So even though the price is falling, they're making more products and and everybody's getting more income, uh, getting better products. So that would be fine, except in this time, falling prices does not seem to be due to increasing productivity, but mm -hmm. rather decreasing demand. And if you have decreased demand, that means, well, even if you wanted to make more products, uh, there's no demand for them, nobody's buying, so uh, uh, nobody's producing, and that means less in jobs, less income, and that's really holding down the global economy as well as the Korean economy right now. I know we mentioned a little bit, but before we go further, can you break down for us both inflation and deflation and what kind of impact they both can have on a country's economy? Okay, well, inflation just means that the price levels are increasing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see prices increasing overall, that's inflation. Deflation, though, means that prices are falling. You have a negative inflation. Okay. So uh, prices overall, if you average it all out, then it is falling. Now, if you have inflation, uh, then, well, price is rising. Nobody's ever happy about it. Uh, but that could, uh, that's uh, sometimes uh, signals that you have a lot of demand and supply is not catching up to it. So that, uh, that could mean that the economy is doing, in a sense, too well. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, if you have deflation, uh, coupled with recession as we have right now, it could make recession really longer uh, because, well, the longer you wait, the prices fall. So the longer you wait, the cheaper the things that you want to buy will be. So people hold off on purchasing. And that means consumption remains low and that means the recovery is delayed. And uh, that could really lengthen the period of recession. All right, let's shift our focus to Zimbabwe in 2008, when its inflation skyrocketed to an astronomical 231 million right. percent, with an egg costing, what, 50 billion Zimbabwean dollars. Wow, can you tell us what exactly happened there? Okay, well, they, ha they always had some problems. They always had uh, 
double-digit inflation rate since the uh, 1970s. Uh, but since 1999, what happened was they got involved into wars and they had a uh, dictatorship and they printed a lot of money to finance the war as well as finance the dictatorship. Uh, so they overprinted money, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, once uh, you started getting a triple-digit inflation, uh, people just lost confidence in money, okay. uh, their own money. So they, uh, rather than accept Zimbabwe dollars, they would uh, accept uh, South African rand or U.S. dollars. Okay. And so since nobody wanted their money, uh, Zimbabwe dollar had lost all confidence. Uh, people demanded more and more Zimbabwe dollars for whatever goods there were. Mm -hmm. So that led to... Uh, inflation rates in the million, hundreds of million percent, uh, billions of percent wow. for a while. Well, we can also look at Japan's loss two decades for an example where a country has fallen into a deflationary trap. Now, tell us more about what happened there and if there are any other countries that had similar uh, times. Okay, well, uh, the uh, Jap Japanese case is that uh, they had a uh, real estate asset bubble that popped during okay. the uh, 80s, late 80s, and that created a recession. Uh, but the uh, price levels, instead of rising, fell. And that's partially because, well, reduced demand from the uh, financial crisis from the bubble popping, but also, like Korea, uh, they had a uh, demographic problem. Uh, uh, everybody was worried about their retirement, so people started hoarding cash, hoarding money and not spending, and that reduced demand, and that created the uh, deflationary uh, environment. And now, uh, J Japan has fairly low consumption because, well, everybody wants to save and not consume. Everybody wants to hoard cash for their uh, retirement. So that, uh, that's one reason why the Japanese slow growth or recession has gone on for so mm -hmm. long. And uh, if you want to uh, get an uh, example of it, you really have to go, other examples of it, you really have to go back to 1930s during the Great Depression era, uh, where they also had some defla global deflation, uh, which lengthened the period of the uh, Great uh, Depression. Mm -hmm. And the uh, European Union, the Eurozone, is afraid that they're going into that same type of uh, recession with deflation. So they're trying everything they can to avoid that. So I guess because of those worries, Japan and some European countries actually announced negative rates to fight against deflation. So how are prices like right now worldwide? Okay, well, countries like uh, Switzerland, they have uh, minus 1.4% uh, inflation rate, uh, Spain uh, minus uh, 0.5. So uh, they're uh, in deflation right now. Uh, countries like Greece and England, they're in 0.1%, so they're on the edge there. Mm. Uh, Japan and Taiwan, 0.3%, so they're also a bit on right. the edge. The United States, they're doing a bit better, 0.5%. Uh, and Korea is actually pretty healthy if you ha use those uh, other countries as comparison. Right. We're at 1.1%. So relatively doing well in that sense. Right. All right, well, there must be numerous factors affecting prices. What are they? Okay, well, the uh, biggest factor, we believe, is the lack of aggregate demand, and that's still a part of the uh, global financial uh, crisis that we had since 2008. But what's also contributing there is that because of the low aggregate demand and high supply in natural resources and oil, the commodity prices and oil prices have gone down a lot, and that's also feeding into the uh, deflationary pressure and it's making things worse. Uh, so uh, a lot of the countries, if you take out the food prices and uh, oil prices, mm -hmm. then uh, they are hitting somewhere between one to 2% inflation rate. Uh, that's called the uh, core inflation rate. So if you just consider the core, a lot of these countries are not really facing deflationary pressure, but the low commod falling commodity prices and the oil prices, if you include that, then that really contributes to the uh, deflation pressure in these countries. All right, looking at Korea's consumer price growth, it fell to below 1% in January, obviously stoking deflationary concerns. Should we be worried? I know we talked about how it's doing relatively well. Yeah, uh, so uh, in 2015, uh, it was 1.1%. There has been a lot of worries because in January, it fell below that, uh, right. below 1% rate. Uh, well, what we can do 
if you look at the core inflation rate, then we're at uh, somewhere around 2% rate. So in that sense, it is the uh, food prices and the oil prices which are primarily responsible. Uh, but also other factors is that, well, on the one hand, government is worried about deflationary pressure. But on the other hand, government is also worried that some prices for goods for uh, the people are going up. So it really pressuring a lot of uh, prices for, uh, from rising. For example, uh, the subway prices, the bus prices have been held in check for a long time. Right. Utility prices as well. And for some uh, important food staples, government has been pressuring the companies not to raise prices so much. So that's also uh, putting it into the pic uh, making the uh, right. price fall, uh, price rise less than it should be. Mm -hmm. Then as countries around the world are putting forth uh, various measures to fight against deflation, what should Korea do in order to keep deflation at bay? Okay, well, uh, the uh, obvious thing to do is monetary policy to reduce inflation and increase the monetary supply. But Korea right now has historically low in, uh, interest rate. Right. And the uh, interest rate monetary policy has, doesn't seem to be working as much as it used to. So uh, if Korea needs to, then it could think about additional interest rate falls. Uh, but for now, I think we're better off using fiscal policy, trying to use government budget to increase uh, demand, uh, which hopefully will uh, increase prices as well. Uh, and uh, if the picture gets worse, then combination of the two is the solution okay. that we combination have. Combination of monetary and, and fiscal, fiscal policies. policies. All right. Thank you so much for coming in today, Professor. Thank you. And that brings us to the end. But we'll be back tomorrow with more business news that matters to you, so don't forget to check back with us then. Thanks for watching, and goodbye for now.